Okay. Well, it's my pleasure as usual to welcome all of you from wherever in the world you're coming um, to the Department of Classics, University of Reading, uh, to our online seminar series on making the classics better. Time has flown very quickly and um, uh, this is our last of our five, six, six, I think it was only five of them, no, six talks, um, uh, trying to cover all different aspects of ways in which um, we can seek um, greater inclusivity, can and are and will do and so on and so forth. And um, it's our immense pleasure uh, to welcome today's speaker, Professor Patrice Rankin from uh, the United States. We didn't make him wake up as early as we did our Australian speaker uh, a few weeks ago, <laughs> um, but uh, we're absolutely delighted that he's found time in his very busy schedule to come speak to us and also joined in some of the earlier presentations in this series. Um, Patrice is an old friend of mine. Uh, we uh, studied together, in fact, at Yale. Uh, that was where he got his PhD after he attended Brooklyn College City of University of New York. He's been professor of classics in many places since then, illustrious universities in the United States. But now he's uh, professor of classics at the University of Richmond, where he's also dean of the School of Arts and Sciences. And back in the United States, being a dean is very important and hopefully powerful thing. And that means that he can get things done. Um, but he always gets things done. And he's probably well known to many of you, uh, not least through his books. Um, Oxford University Handbook on Greek Drama in the Americas, where he was co-editor with Catherine Bosher, Fiona McIntosh, Justine McConnell. Um, that was back in 2015. Um, and also closer to, day, to today's theme, um, Aristotle of Black Drama, Theater of Civil Disobedience, uh, back in 2013, and Ulysses in Black, Ralph Ellison, Classicism and African American Literature in 2006. Um, he's got a lot of really interesting stuff in progress, Black Poetry and the Classics for Brill's, um, one of Brill's many companions actually, uh, also working on Euripides, Helen and the Trouble with Gender and Identity in Queer Euripides, um, which is co-edited by Sarah Olson and Mario Tello and should be out ooh, any minute now, maybe next month. And uh, Loss of Faith Brings Vertigo, Black Lives, the Classics, and Three Ancient Sites for Reflection on Productive Failure for the Classical Ancient World Studies volume that Mathura Umachandran and Marcella Ward are bringing out also next month. So um, plenty of extra reading uh, after you've been um, uh, enthused and inspired, hopefully, by uh, today's talk. So um, without any more from me, may I urge, exhort you to, if you haven't already done so, turn off your audio and video so that we can pay attention to our speaker. Um, uh, you're not necessarily going to hear from me again, unless I'm, I'll still be here. Maybe I'll have some questions, but I'm going to turn the question and answers over to my uh, joint head of department, my, my other half head, uh, Barbara Goff. Professor Barbara Goff. And um, meanwhile, if you have any questions, uh, either please wait till the end of the presentation, at which point um, we will be able to invite you to turn on your audio camera if you put your virtual hand up or put comments, questions in the chat, meanwhile. Uh, so um, please uh, 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 join me in welcoming um, Professor Patrice Rankin, the classics and our values. Over to you, Patrice. Hi, thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Amy, for such a wonderful and warm introduction. Hello, everyone, though I cannot see you. I'm really pleased to be part of this series. It's been a wonderful series. I've not attended live, but I've been able to catch each one on YouTube, and it's just been really rich. I think about Louise uh, Hitchcock's collapse, uh, COVID and collapse, a really deep dive into Mycenaean historiography um, and what uh, the value of uh, such a period might uh, bring to us when we think about our own collapse and re regeneration, rebounding from, from COVID. I thought that was really a, a great uh, paper. Among all the others, I got to attend Holly Rangers uh, last time around. Um, and in that case, uh, what I'm doing here today is much like what Holly was doing, uh, because we're each working on an article, as you just heard, for um, Critical Ancient World Studies. And what I'm presenting here today is going to weave in and out of um, uh, the paper that I'm putting together for that volume, 
and, um, and some reflections on papers I've given throughout this academic year for what is emerging uh, uh, to be a, a, larger, a larger work that I'm uh, thinking through and puzzling through. Um, for this work, uh, again, um, Amy has been a great lifelong companion in the classics and uh, Barbara Goff and Michael Simpson, uh, you know, I keep thinking as I was putting together uh, the work and notes for today about crossroads in the back, crossroads in the Black Aegean, which I still think uh, gives us even today, um, it's been a while since its publication, but I, it gives us a roadmap for um, some engagement. That, that goes, I think, a little bit beyond um, reception in the same way that Holly Ranger was uh, exhorting us to go a little bit beyond classical reception, that there might be some pitfalls and so on in reception model per se. Uh, I'm gonna warn everyone, as did Professor Ranger, that uh, the topic uh, is sobering. Uh, it is arresting uh, today. I'm gonna talk a lot about race and racism. And there are going to be times when it sounds like I'm being extremely pessimistic and totalizing. Um, uh, you know, this is much less optimistic than Arlene Holmes Henderson's uh, talk um, on uh, kind of outreach uh, uh, in our field. Um, and I hope you'll sort of just come along with me a little bit and um, see why why that is. Uh, although in the end, I do think I offer um, at least for myself and hopefully for others. Uh, some bit of um, of hope. And I'm going to see uh, if this will advance and if not. OK, I should have control. Ah, there we are. OK, so many who have yeah, I've been on Zoom all year. Um, this is my first time, uh, second time presenting on on Teams, so it's going to be a little bit awkward. But um, those who've, uh, who have attended my talks throughout the year have seen me open with this uh, poster, this uh, uh, plywood painting of George Floyd. Uh, you've watched the news from the United States. Floyd was uh, murdered on May 25th, 2020 with the heel, the knee really, of uh, police officer Derek Chauvin on his neck as he pled for life. Uh, this was a really jarring moment that led to a number of protests, ongoing protests across the United States. Here in the city of Richmond, imagine the Confederate monuments that lined Monument Avenue. Uh, these were monuments to uh, the lost cause, uh, those who had lost in the Civil War, uh, uh, the Confederates brought against the United States from 1861 to 1865. Well, here in the city of Richmond and in many cities, by the end of the 19th into the beginning of the 20th century, um, uh, Daughters of the Confederacy and other groups uh, raised money and erected statues uh, with the assistance of city officials across the country uh, honoring uh, this lost cause. Statues to people like Robert E. Lee, Stonewall Jackson, and so on and so forth. Uh, this summer, those statues were arrayed with protesters across the summer, uh, graffiti uh, across the base of these statues, um, uh, Black Lives Matter, and so on. And in storefronts, as you can see behind this poster, uh, 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 store owners uh, protected the storefront, the glass with plywood. And here, tattoo artist uh, Jesse Smith, owner of a tattoo parlor in the city called Loose Screw Tattoo, painted the mural uh, on plywood, paying homage to, to George Floyd. Why am I? Why have I been putting this image, these events, in conversation with the classics and in a conversation with the question of what I value and what I am uh, asking us to value within um, the course of the year in the classics? The, these events, for many of us, and indeed for me, uh, was re were really a realignment. Really led to a realignment of how I want to spend my time in the coming weeks, months, and years. Again, this has happened for so many of us, uh, not just because of COVID, in many cases because of COVID, but in, in for many of us beyond COVID, also what has been called over and over again within the United States, a time of racial reckoning. The question of value uh, comes up for me in this. What do we value? How do we spend our time? What is our identity? What are our commitments and investments? And today, again, I want to give you some sense of the paper I'm writing for Classical Ancient World Studies, uh, this volume that is being put together by Marcella Ward and Mar uh, Mathura uh, Umachandra. Um, and 
Holly Ranger's question uh, last time around, uh, what is potentially subversive in such fields as classical reception studies and what might not be so subversive in those fields? Um, I've been working with and thinking a lot about what our colleagues were trying to do in the volume, the Post-Classicisms Collective. Uh, I don't think we've spent enough time this year uh, talking about this volume. Our, our colleagues, um, many of them very well-known colleagues in the classics, uh, put together this book, and it's quite a provocation in many ways. And in, to me, what is an arresting passage in the book, the authors chart new directions for the classics, raising questions particularly about value, the question of value, the investment as to why anyone would study the discipline. And although there are a number of challenges to the framework and apparent preten uh, pretenses of the work, some of which Joanna Hanink explored in her 2020 review essay, the author's discussions, discussion of value values, I think is apropos to what I've been thinking about. And I quote here, value marks the investment that we as moderns make in the culture of the past. The reason that is why we are drawn to it. These reasons may be intellectual, aesthetic, ethical, political, or effective in nature. They may, ex they may be explicit or implicit. As classicists, we always turn to the past because we want something from it, even if we cannot articulate or do not know exactly what that is. That's the end of the quote. The parsing is, to be sure, artificial. It's an artifice, as if, for example, intellectual and political reasons can be really separated, or that ethical and the effective, ethical can be uh, 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 separated from the effective. It is true that for many classicists, the commitment to the study of the past is implicit, at least not always even discernible to ourselves or to others. Pressing the value question even further, because indeed the post-classicisms collective leaves intact much of what was classical, even in its posterior move, classical ancient world studies promises, uh, promisingly reframes the value question, jarring us from accepting any terms of the status quo classical. And this was really the, um, the claims that uh, Hanink made in her review essay. Um, you know, she asks, for example, should we hold Nietzsche and Willemowitz ever in view as the post-classicisms collective group does? Um, and I'm wondering today and have been wondering in my own mind and now say it out loud, if the critique of this volume has really attenuated Com the conversation that might come from the provocations that our colleagues have offered us in the volume. Not only that, but also the um, approach they're taking by being a collective rather than individual scholars, which was also a theme in this series. As a black man whose affinities lie more with George Floyd than with Johann Goethe, I take issue, I take the issue of value that is, uh, the, the issue of value to heart. And um, we heard from Holly Ranger again on feminisms and receptions. And I want to offer as well that there, I think there are intersectional and entangled conversations to be had here. My focus today on black lives, but um, I see a real affinity in what uh, Professor Ranger was doing. In my article for Classical Ancient World Studies, I approach my own investments in the classics, what I want from the field with a consciousness of how much damage Western civilization has done, and I, Western civilization, again, a term we can come back to, but how much damage Western civilization has done to people of African descent, whether through the extra extraction of enslaved people from the continent or in the colonizing moves of the dominance over those regions independent of the transatlantic slave trade, if, if we could ever think of regions as independent of that moment in history. Western history, and again, Western history here is a phrase we can come back to, Western history has failed black people in the collective, even if individual black uh, people, individual black families in Europe and South and North America have been able somehow to thrive. And lest folks in the audience um, think, oh, Patrice, this is an American problem, right? This is not a problem uh, that we're really concerned with here in the UK. Um, I, you think of someone like a Mark Duggan and uh, the riots that his uh, uh, death uh, tipped off in 2011. Um, I know uh, that uh, history has revised the incidents here. I know that um, uh, 
uh, Duggan was perhaps armed. Um, uh, he was perhaps involved in cri criminal activity. Uh, but it is the case that in, in all of these cases in the UK and in the United States, character is the first area of attack, is the first area of assault. And what I'm asking is, if, is there something bigger here uh, than the individual character? Um, I point you again to Gillian Slovo's The Riots, uh, which um, uh, was a piece of documentary theater that collected the voices in the aftermath of these riots in the UK. Maybe I should use the word uprisings. I've been working on a couple of broader projects beyond classical ancient world studies, within which my particular contributions to this volume fit. In the article for classical ancient world studies and the broader projects from which I draw, I have been drawing, I should say, this year, I meditate on what I see as this failure, this impasse between European modernity and what it wanted from antiquity. Here again, the post-classical classicisms collective on the one side and black artists and literary uh, tradition on the other. If the Black Atlantic was a creative and productive trope, my essay for the project lingers on its limitations. And here is where I think Goff and Simpson have a lot to say for us too. I find for this journey companionship in the artistic work of Michael Richards. And I show you a slide here of a piece called Winged that is here in the museum in Richmond. Uh, we in Richmond own this uh, museum, uh, this piece rather. Um, I find com companionship in his work because of his study of the Icarus myth. Those who've heard me speak throughout the year know that I've been um, thinking about Icarus. Uh, and this is a story that I want to hold as a quintessential trope of the failed relationship between Western civilization and people of African descent. I side with Leonard Harris, a proponent of philosophy born of struggle, which I'll tell you about momentarily, that project in his claim that the suffering of black people has been unnecessary as opposed to the moral arc that Martin Luther King Jr. proposed. Remember, the arc of the moral universe is long but bends toward justice. I'm opposing that, uh, as, as did uh, Leonard Harris in his work. Adding to these perspectives, the queer theorization of Jack Halberstam, namely that failure itself is a notable theoretical tool I apply my modern investments, my sense of the value of a radical epistemic shift to reflections upon three ancient cultures themselves deemed failures to the West, the Phoenicians, the Kushites, and West Africa broadly. And we won't be able to get into those case studies today, but it gives you a sense of um, how I'm using uh, the modern world, the modern pieces to reflect back on the ancient world and what we might, how we might reconfigure the study of the ancient world. For Icarus, I was really heartened and uh, uh, kind of enthusiastic about Susan Deasy's talk um, and the uh, Our Mythical Childhood Project, which I think uh, I'll be able to draw from. That's really interesting that there is this project in the UK around childhood and uh, the use of myth uh, in child development. And her talk, of course, was on uh, children with autism. But I wanted to say a little bit about how I came to Michael Richards' work because it wasn't necessarily something I, I knew about at all. But I began the year uh, having uh, last summer reread Malcolm X's autobiography. Uh, Malcolm X, of course, the um, maybe we can call him the anti-civil rights activist of the 1960s who was killed in uh, 65. Um, and in his biography, he actually talks about his study of much literature uh, while he was in prison, but particularly classical myth. And in one passage at his height, when this unschooled, um, uh, you know, if we did classical reception studies as we did uh, last time around with Holly Ranger, we would talk about how people are educated, where they went to school, so on and so forth. Well, Malcolm X's training, his education was in a jail cell. Um, and yet he's able to give uh, these talks and out debate debaters at Harvard University. And he likens that to the Icarus myth. He says, there I stood, the invited speaker at Harvard, a story that I had read in prison when I was reading a lot of Greek mythology flicked in my head. The boy Icarus, do you remember the story? Icarus's father made some wings that he fastened with wax. And the father says, never fly so high with these wings. But soaring around this way, that way, Icarus flying pleased him so much that he began thinking he was flying on his own merit. Higher he flew, 
until the heat of the sun melted the wax holding those wings. Down came Icarus, tumbling. There, sitting there by the Harvard window, I silently vowed to Allah that I never would forget that any wings I wore had been put on by the religion of Islam. And he has never forgotten it, he says. This is such a fascinating passage. And we might talk about Alex Haley, um, the ghostwriter of the autobiography, uh, Alex's, Alex Haley's own literary kind of background, um, the crafter of Roots that became a miniseries on television, uh, one of the first really sort of epic works to um, um, sort of grapple with the lineage of slavery um, for um, contemporary, at the time, uh, African-Americans. But that was Malcolm X, and I began to wonder where else, you know, what other African-American artists and authors were grappling with Icarus? And I came to Richard Barthe, who um, did this uh, Fallen Aviator in 1945, a little uh, figurine that is in the collection at Tuskegee Institute. Um, and Barthe was known to Ralph Ellison. Uh, he was a, a, an artist um, uh, known uh, across the uh, Renaissance, Harlem Renaissance, into the middle of the 20th century. Uh, he's a Chicago-based artist. And, um, you know, we can talk a little bit also about uh, the Tuskegee Airmen um, who flew uh, double the missions of uh, white uh, aviators during World War II and came back to second-class citizenship uh, during segregated times. Um, I think about uh, Icarus of James uh, Lesesne Wells, uh, well, a Harvard, uh, sorry, a Howard uh, professor, a How Howard University artist. Uh, this Icarus wood engraving that was up in a show here at the University of Richmond last semester, 1968. So we might think of this in terms of, again, the post-civil rights moment, uh, the Black arts movement, uh, and uh, the role of art like this within the Black arts movement, uh, for which we might also include um, Robert Hayden, um, where we have classical myth in the title, O Daedalus Fly Away Home, but at the same time, um, sort of Afrocentric, um, uh, Africa-centered um, uh, poetics. Uh, the night is the Juba, night is Congo. Uh, 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 I, the second, second uh, page there, I knew all the stars of Africa, spread my wings and cleave the air. So the flight back home to Africa being coupled with the Daedalus myth. In that same context of black arts, we would include Toni Morrison, um, uh, Song of Solomon, at the beginning of that novel, we begin with a suicide, a plunge down uh, from a character who uh, seems to, in the beginning at least, have no real immediate relevance to the story itself. So I, we could keep going, um, again, for the reception of the Icarus myth and the broader themes of Icarus within the context of uh, classical reception. Um, for the classics and those who want the slides, um, you know, uh, I begin to think about the uh, Cretan cycle more broadly. Uh, where else do we see the Cretan cycle of myth? Uh, there's a poet called Ruth Ellen Coker who has a Pisiphae uh, poem, uh, and we could go on and on. Uh, by the way, Tessa Roynan, uh, her new book, The Classical Tradition and Modern American Fiction, comes back to this Icarus story as well, uh, even in authors like Ralph Ellison. Um, where I initially, in the uh, early part of uh, the, the, the century, <laughs> was interested in Ralph Ellison and Ulysses, the theme of Odysseus, uh, but also there is B.P. Uh, uh, Reinhardt, Reinhard, Proteus Bliss Reinhardt, in um, the novel Invisible Man, who is a kind of Daedalian uh, figure, and so on and so forth. So that's how I came to our friend, uh, Michael Richards, um, through just kind of uh, working through these pieces and having a curator here at the museum tell me about uh, that winged piece I showed you earlier and said, oh, we have this in the collection and showed me that image. Um, and I began to think about Michael Richards, born in 1963, uh, graduated from Queens College, City University of New York. So he's uh, uh, like I, uh, I graduated from Brooklyn College, also City University of New York. He's a little bit uh, uh, older, uh, about a, a decade uh, my senior, uh, New York University uh, for his art degree, beloved in Miami, um, uh, Ulite uh, Arts uh, Studio, uh, has a scholarship in his name now, and he held his studio, uh, think about this as you think about the theme of flight, he had his studio in the World Trade Center where he was killed on 9-11-2001. 
So his work is almost prescient in terms of flight and plunge from flight. He was already a subject of revival by 2012, owing to the Black Lives Matter movement. Uh, and then by 2020, of course, George Floyd would become a new referent for Richard's work. Floyd now included in the tragic catalog of persons transformed into heroic martyrs. And in front of you, look at the title, Tar Baby versus St. Sebastian. So he takes the uh, image of St. Sebastian, and rather than daggers, he has airplanes flying into this uh, black uh, protagonist. The reference to loss of faith in the title of a piece I'll show you momentarily problematizes notions of the heroic, as if this image in, in itself doesn't problematize notions of the heroic. In this case, the Icarus myth is more than a clever accoutrement. Rather, it is central to the study of failure, the juxtaposition of the classical humanistic traditions into which Richard's work enters, and the figure of his own black features and his own body is something akin to horror. How does one reconcile modernity's rationalism anchored in classical humanism with the brutal, repeated state-sanctioned and vigilante murders of young black people in the United States and elsewhere across the black Atlantic? Police force in the United States, in fact, was founded for the control of black bodies during slavery. The Second Amendment um, and the right to bear arms in the United States founded under the same provisions. Put succinctly, if even bluntly, the Enlightenment, as it played out in the United States, was never friendly to the African presence. John Locke extended the self to include the property that one owned, every man a king. But the African was never a person, Aristotle's animate tool, more in line with the phenomenon at hand. The ongoing violence against Black bodies should be no surprise. This violence speaks to an ontology that increasingly seems unshakable with the passage of time. Within this ontology of repeated horror and the impossibility of escape and as ex existential and systemic failure, an Afro-pessimistic response is reasonable, a kind of common sense of things, as one scholar puts it. As Frank B. Wilderson III, an architect of Afro-pessimism, himself puts it in its autobiographical treatise, one is, quote, pessimistic about the claims theories of liberation make when these theories try to explain Black suffering or when they analogize Black suffering with the suffering of other oppressed beings, unquote. Rather than establishing a hierarchy of suffering wherein one oppressed group has been more disadvantaged than another, Wilderson points to the particulars of Black history, the entanglement of Black subjects with unrelenting suffering. What is worse, as Leonard Harris, father of philosophy born of struggle, argues, such suffering is not only incessant, but it is unnecessary, irredeemable, and without purpose. The day in April of 2021, when the murder of Floyd, ex-police officer Derek Chauvin, was sentenced to prison, another officer killed a 20-year-old young man, Dante Wright, who was stopped because of an air fresher improperly hanging from his window. The accidental nature of the killing belies the indignity surrounding Black life. The realities that allow such an accident to be incessantly repeated. Harris summarizes the contention of philosophy born of struggle as follows. And here I show you uh, 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 from his piece, ignore his Latin, it, it, it doesn't work out. <laughs> but he says, I contend as a normative claim that genuine philosophy is philosophy as and sourced by strife, tenaciousness, organisms striving, the result of intellectual struggle with real corporeal existence, always inclusive of under duress. It is sentient being that can be afflicted and thereby no concept of form, dialectical rationality, phenomenology, sagacious, sagacious insight, uh, confession, testimonial or witnessing is warranted without the expressed inclusion of the afflicted seen as such. And what, what uh, Harris does for philosophy, I'm in the background here wondering if we can't do for classics. 
Harris rejects many of the claims of Western philosophy because they do not adhere, do not represent or belong to his experience. For example, in his article from a volume called African American Perspectives on Biomedical Ethics, titled Autonomy Under Duress, he argues, quote, that there are limits for what we can expect a concept, even a theoretically rich concept, such as the autonomous person, to provide. Um, So, so all concepts, he says, are contingent, as if the autonomous I, the cogito ergo sum, um, uh, were autonomous, as if this, this subject were autonomous. In Autonomy Under Duress, Harris explores the example of, the, of a fictionalized Dr. Dick. And I wanted to just kind of put, that's what I wanted to do. That's what was the pause. There's a um, quote that I want to just let hang in the background there on uh, autonomy. Um, and how he uh, defines autonomy. In Autonomy Under Duress, Harris explores the example of the fictionalized Dr. Dick, who castrated George Washington Carver, making him a eunuch so as to protect the black man living through American reconstruction and segregation from the threat of lynching. Again, follow through this example now uh, from Harris, this notion of autonomy. Um, so the idea is this fictionalized doctor who castrates George Washington Carver is doing so because he's afraid that if Washington Carver is allowed to exist with his phallus and with his power, let's say, um, will be accused of uh, violence against white women, as was the constant claim uh, of black men um, during the segregated period, the, the fear of miscegenation being at the forefront of American society. So Dr. Dick, within this contingent context, is doing a good thing. In the same way, Dr. Dick would perform abortions on white women whom black men had impregnated so as to prevent mixed race offspring. In the dominant American discourses of the late 19th and early 20th century, separation of the races was a positive good, a reality that the United States Supreme Court affirmed in the 1896 case Plessy versus Ferguson. So Dr. Dick's good acts are historically contingent. For these acts of castration and preventing misraised offspring can be read as well-intentioned within his social context, problematizing the notion of autonomous agents and any generalized, decontextualized Kantian claim to a categorical imperative. You can see where Harris is going. Harris demonstrates how one can bear witness to confess to, give testimony about, offer insight on what it means to struggle against one's reality, to side with the afflicted, and what perspectives can emerge from this affiliation. In a way here, we're talking about a kind of um, experiential, uh, ex existential reality that goes against um, uh, found uh, concepts and received notions in the in the Western tradition, right? My experience is different from what you're telling me. I have to find truth and reality in my existence. And there's a lot of black existential philosophy that we can draw on to explain more if we want to explain more. So back to Richard, The Loss of Faith Brings Vertigo is the title of a 1994 sculptural work in which the centerpiece is a spinning bust fashioned after the artist himself. And I apologize that this is not the clearest picture. It's a snap from the virtual tour of the museum, which is on display now. This exhibit exhibition is on display in the uh, North Miami uh, Contemporary Museum, uh, Museum of Contemporary Art, MOCA. A review of the 2019 retrospective at the Stanford Art Gallery put it this way of the piece, um, that quote, the black male body is in a state of distress psychologically and physically torn apart. And Richards wants to concretize the pain, what he calls the pain and alienation of black experiences in the Atlantic world, using his own body, as he puts it, quote, as the primary locus of experience, as a die from which to make casts, unquote. In addition to the busts of black men that he would fashion, 
Richard returns time and again, as I've said earlier, to the Icarus myth, stories of flight and its catastrophic failure, themes that would be rendered prophetic in light of his own 2011 death at the World Trade Center. Again, that middle piece is, is the bust that is spinning in a circle. Think of Vertigo again here with that target as an image of Rodney King being beaten. Loss of faith might certainly characterize the potential pessimism accompanying racial identity in the United States in the early 2020s. A period of such letdown after the apparent post-racial gains that the election of Barack Obama was to have ushered in. The significance of Richard's work, and in particular the five busts of a loss of faith to the racial reckoning of the early 2020s, was already captured, perhaps also prophetically, in the New York Times review of the Art Center at Governor's Island 2016 show, which was called Michael Richards Winged. And I'm going to read you a little quote that gives you a sense of the review of this piece that you're looking at. But just think of the years here. Richards is dead by 2001. And yet think of the revival after the killing of Trayvon Martin in 2012. Um, these, this piece was on display in Stanford and in New York, uh, 2016, 2019. This is all before COVID and uh, George Floyd of 2020. Now on display again in Miami through this year into October. And here is the New York Times. Four white busts rest on a pedestal with plaques that say, uh, you see the plaques, so all the four except the middle one say, when I was young, I wanted to be a policeman. They look as though they're wearing black masks. Up close, it's clear that the masks are really photographs of police brutality applied to faces. A fifth bust in the center spins. A small image of Rodney King appears on its brow like a target. The plaque, this plaque is different. And the article goes on to say this plaque reads, a loss of faith brings vertigo. The 1994 work, its centerpiece, the spinning bust with the target-like image of Rodney King, is a direct response to the, 2000, to the 1991 beating of King, Rodney King, by four police officers in Los Angeles, which was captured on videotape for the world to see. The event itself a precursor to the infinite repetitions of similar images and moving pictures captured now on cell phones. These images reify and retell of the brutality against black bodies, the unbearable feather lightness of violence enacted upon the racialized, gendered other. Through these images, dating as far back as lynching photographs in the United States, blacks are ceremonially tarred and feathered. Thus, the repeated use of tar and feathers in Richard's work is notable, even chilling. Faith falls as lightly as the penetration of as the perpetuation of violence. The human toll as precipitous as Icarus's plummet from the sky. So in the article that I developed for classical ancient world studies, I will go on to explore alternatives to the positivistic, hopeful narrative of success that we have uh, in the West. Taking Richard's loss of faith as a point of departure, my vertiginous spinning head turns away from Greece and Rome and points me gropingly to three other ancient cultures heretofore predominantly silenced because of Europe's narratives of success. Here again, um, when we think about this question, what do we want from the past? I ask, what do we want from Greece and Rome? And um, might it be efficacious to look elsewhere? Um, you know, so here again, uh, uh, similar to what uh, Harris is doing for philosophy, um, I want to take uh, what we are experiencing uh, in the contemporary world to jar, uh, because of my own vertigo, uh, to jar how I'm approaching the classics and whether or not there might not be other ways um, and other things we might see um, if we were to look elsewhere and think otherwise about the classics. So not only in terms of geography, but also in terms of approach. If we think of the locations that I've mentioned, um, uh, Carthage as the sort of uh, center of the Phoenician, um, um, let's call it an empire, um, uh, Kush, 
um, and then also West Africa. Um, I would say, of course, they've been at the margins of our discipline, but as going back to Halberstam, as Al Halberstam puts it, as Halberstam puts it, quote, disciplines qualify and disqualify, legitimate and delegitimate, reward and punish. Most importantly, they statically reproduce themselves and inhibit dissent, end of quote. So the culture has failed from our perspective, according to the historical narrative, and yet their presences threaten to undo neat and tidy closure. By rejecting discipline, our discipline, for the time being, I focus on the propositions that Halberstam adds to Fred Moten and Stefano Harney's essay, The University and the Undercommons, Seven Theses. If failure is Halberstam's first focal point, first addition to these theses, we might secondly consider these three cultures as unteachable. Because they produce little to no discernible writing, studying these cultures alongside or in place of Greece and Rome is nonsensical. And here by writing, I'm talking about literature. That said, my aim is to linger on the loss. So if the cultures are unteachable, Halberstam says, by lingering in failure, we are actually lingering in what is unteachable, what is not kind of uh, translatable, um, but it's worth, she ar uh, he argues, uh, lingering uh, in that. Thirdly, Halberstam asks the reader to suspect memorialization. Think again of those statues I talked about on Monument Avenue at the beginning of the talk. Um, why memorialize? What is memorialization doing? O along with Avery Gordon, Halberstam, quote, advocates for certain forms of erasure over memory precisely because memorialization has a tendency to tidy up disorderly histories, histories of slavery, histories of the Holocaust, histories of war, and so on, end of quote. In the paper, I draw on Cush, Carthage, and West Africa as historical analogs to Richard's cultural meditations on Icarus. His attempts at shifting our gaze away from a certain mythologi mythologization toward the symptom of what is prevalent now, as he puts it, the symptoms of what is prevalent now. Herein is not the revisionist Afrocentrism that presents a black Socrates or a black Cleopatra, but rather an epistemic shift away from center in Europe altogether. Nor should Cush, Carthage, and West Africa be swept up in an analogical or genealogical narrative. That is, although Cush, Carthage, and West Africa were ancient powers, and for that reason, they might well be part of a recentering of the discipline of classics that could draw interest from other contemporary people who value something other than Europe. That's not what I'm after here. The object here is not productivity, not to propose pedagogical or disciplinary tools, but rather to linger. Lingering allows contemplation on what might have been and how the current state of affairs could have been different. Or in Halberstam's words, quote, the social world we inhabit, after all, as so many thinkers have reminded us, are not inevitable, end of quote. Failure here does not reflect these cultures' lack of productivity, but rather it denotes the unviability of a constructive relationship between Europe and them. And here, um, just to uh, come to a close here and wrap up, um, I'm not, of course, the first person to um, talk about the kind of reorientation of the ancient world around something like what we're looking at now, right? Why center Greece and Rome? Um, you've got the, I don't know if you can see my arrow, but you've got the Phoenicians uh, uh, based here, um, uh, 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 moving to a center in uh, Carthage by the 9th century BCE. Um, south of uh, Egypt, uh, Upper Nile, we have the Kush, we have the Nubian region, and then um, you know, as early as the third millennium BCE in West Africa, there's also activity uh, in places like uh, modern day Nigeria and Ife um, as a capital of uh, Yoruba uh, power. Um, in doing this shift, you know, the first thing you would think when you look at, um, and this was my own sort of movement, when you look at the busts in um, uh, Richard's display, you think, oh, he's working in the context of uh, classical sculpture and so on and so forth. And yet, um, I point to Susan Preston Blyer's uh, book, Art and Risk in Ancient Yoruba, um, 
This is an image from a sculpture studio uh, in Ife, um, uh, an area untouched uh, uh, by uh, the West, notwithstanding um, uh, Le uh, uh, yeah, uh, uh, for Frobinus and, and others um, uh, 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 attempting to uh, argue that this region is actually um, an outpost of Greece. Uh, but uh, we have technology uh, sculpture uh, uh, early on in this region, and I wonder to what extent um, Richards is, is looking uh, to this region as well, rather than to Greece and Rome in his own uh, movement, uh, even as he uh, tropes Icarus and so on. I'll stop there, um, giving you a lot, but I just wanted to give you a sense of where my head is and what I've been doing and thinking about um, Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you so much, Patrice, for that tremendous talk. Um, as you said, a great deal for us to think about. And um, let me uh, welcome everyone to do precisely that to um, pose questions, please write in the chat or alternatively uh, stick up your hand and I will endeavour to um, discover who is doing which at this point. Um, I'm not seeing any hands or chats currently. So a moment possibly to digest. But let me go ahead, Patrice, and lead off then. Thank you so much, which is fascinating. And Possibly I want to start at a, a sort of little bit of a tangent, but some of the things that you were saying were connecting up with other things that I've heard people say recently or more to the point heard people question. And you had Malcolm X uh, studying Greek mythology in prison and I was recently hearing people talking about prison education and talking about how incarcerated African Americans in these particular instances had been engaging very creatively and very energetically with uh, classical texts with Greek tragedy and epic and so forth. Um, is that part of a discourse of classical, of, of the exceptionalism of classics, whereby it's Greek myths that can be so meaningful to people in their very difficult circumstances? And, or is it, you know, is it an accident like Malcolm X might have read Shakespeare, for instance, or something like that and found similar images that he could work with, which I suppose, you know, does come round to your uh, one of your many larger questions, the value that we put on the discipline and the texts and artifacts within it. Yeah. Um, yeah I think let, let me I'm speaking for myself here. Um, you know, I think there's an early turn where, as classicists, we find a Ralph Ellison, we find an Amy Césaire, we find, you know, uh, a Toni Morrison, and we're so excited that here are these uh, marginalized groups and individuals uh, engaging with our discipline. It therefore must have value. It had value to them. Um, there was, a, for me, in my process, a shift where I began to ask a deeper why. You know, what, why was Ralph Ellison interested in uh, the classics? Um, you know, so there's a superficial, oh, he wanted to be accepted by the literati of his time. But then there is a kind of deeper problem-solving mode um, where people are trying to find answers to existential questions. Um, Malcolm X is searching for the truth. There's a documentary um, on um, 
Mike Tyson uh, that uh, was aired uh, two weeks in a row, uh, two part documentary. Um, and I was struck in thinking about this presentation since I watched the second part last night, I was struck by two things in that documentary. The first was that Mike loved to play with pigeons. He uh, homed pi pigeons uh, from the rooftop in Brooklyn, New York. And in fact, was brought into boxing because uh, he was bullied as a child and um, someone threatened his pigeons. Um, he talks about flight. I was struck by that because similar to a Ralph Ellison story and the beginning of um, also the beginning of Native Son, the notion of being trapped in an urban locale here in the United States and flight on the other side, the notion of uh, for for um, Ellison, for Wright, for Mike Tyson, of flying home, flying away, uh, being free from these circumstances um, are thematic. And they go all the way back to the kind of stories that um, Toni Morrison tells us that slaves, enslaved people shared with one another. Um, that was the first thing. The second thing that struck me about Tyson was that while he was in prison for three years, um, he says in an interview something like, I paraphrase here, I paraphrase here, but it's close to a quote, I heard about a guy named Homer. And he told story, this story about, you know, he, he was reading a lot. He said, I read about a guy named Homer. And he was telling this story of conflict and war. And, and I'm struck by, you know, on the one hand, um, the kind of establishment of prison libraries and uh, prison education and certificate courses that went out of uh, favor in the 1990s, but that were very uh, prevalent into the mid uh, uh, 90s, early to mid 90s, that uh, imprisoned people did have access to education and could read and could but it wasn't that they were interested in the classics per se. They were seekers of truth. They were interested in something deeper, something more existential. So when we think about classics as an instrument to something, um, an instrument to learning, an instrument to uh, uplift and so on, uh, for a lot of uh, uh, these writers, um, it is only a first step to, again, the ancient world, um, you know, there are in, in, in Malcolm X's uh, uh, Nation of Islam, there are many strange stories of the ancient world that are not Euro based. They're not Greek and Roman stories. Um, they're strange stories that, um, you know, are a mix of uh, biblical legend with um, uh, oral storytelling. Um, you know, and people are kind of, Malcolm X himself, are trying to push past these stories to what is true? You know, how much of this is the kind of noble lie of Plato and, and where is truth beyond these stories? Um, and I guess that's kind of the move that I'm trying to make here. You know, are there wisdoms beyond Greece and Rome that we're neglecting? Um, not in this sort of artificial way, but, but, um, but where else have others looked and have we neglected? That's great, thank you. Jessica, if you'd like to come on camera or mic and put your question. Um, this is going to sound a bit iffy. I've been trying to work it out into a nice, um, sensible sentence, but I'm not sure how it's going to uh, work. So kind of adjacent to Icarus being given his wings, um, the Icarus myth has always emphasised uh, kind of flying too high as the cause of his downfall. But at least in the later, oh, uh, Ovid myth, flying too close to the sea is also a problem. I think that's actually the cause of it. It's like um, the sun loosens it, but the sea spray um, destroys the feathers. And I've always felt this was a kind of warning about kind of moderation because the classical Greeks loved um, don't strive too high, but also don't be too low. And I thought, is this kind of facet of the prevalence of the Icarus myth that's kind of stick to what you are given? Um, don't aim too high, don't go too low, just stay in the center. Yeah, um, th that's certainly how Malcolm X is reading it, right? Um, there is something else there that I've talked about before and I'm trying to work out about fate. Um, there's a kind of mean, but there's also um, a kind of uh, notion of one's place in society and, and the limits that society is putting on the individual. 
Um, and, you know, when you look at the Tuskegee Airmen, for example, that's certainly the mode in which uh, Barthe and certainly Michael Richards uh, is also thinking about the Tuskegee Airmen. He's thinking about that as well. Um, so, yeah, there's something about uh, human temperance. What can I do to control uh, circumstances around me? But then there's also it, you know, the broader kind of um, circumstances where in Ellison's case, uh, you get the protagonist and others talking about plunging outside of history, right? Is there a way out of this? Um, yeah, so um, interested in what you're saying there. Thank you. I'm going to take a question and, and comment from Bunny in the chat, who I know is without camera and mic and so forth. And Bunny says, thank you so much for this talk. Um, I think your final comment about seeing things through other perspectives is critical. Not only do I agree that many would incorrectly think the model for the exhibition would be Greco-Roman, but also I fear that even on discovery that this isn't the case, those people would know little about, from, about the culture from which the inspiration did derive. So what is the most important way that we can address this in pedagogy, in classics and in archaeology? Yeah, I mean, that's the million dollar question. I appreciate that question. And that's what, you know, I'm trying to work out. I've been saying on some of these calls throughout the year that um, I, for one, have been miseducated, uh, to borrow from Carter G. Woodson, and need to re-educate myself, right? Because if I were to teach Michael Richards, um, I would have to now get up to speed on, um, Again, a book like Flyers, um, you know, um, art, risk, and innovation within um, uh, Yoruba art, uh, for example. Um, you know, so we have a lot of work to do as classicists if we want to be open to be uh, proficient in and have as compatible with the classics a culture like uh the ife uh, uh the culture the cultures i should say based at ife um because you also include yoruba uh alongside igbo, igbo and so on and so forth right it's not just uh, a culture um so we have a lot of learning to do number one and as far as archaeology is concerned i'm struck by the number of times reading about carthage um i have you know uh show and tell here um you know the uh, oxford handbook of the Phoenicians and Punic Mediterranean. You know, how many times in these volumes do you hear the phrase, um, some sites have been unex unexcavated. Well, why haven't they been excavated? Politics, resources. Um, this is true for Phoenicia. It's true for, um, it's certainly true for Kush, right? The, the, the amount of times I read in specialists of these areas um, that sites have been under excavated, unexcavated, or destroyed upon excavation um, is astounding. Great. Um, Rebecca Lightfoot, if you would ask your question and then Oliver, and then I'll take another question from the chat. Go ahead, Rebecca. Are you perhaps muted? I think, uh, you, you I think, you think it's okay now. Are we okay now? Can you yes. hear me? Yeah, yeah. Technical issues at all times. <laughs> um, I, I was reading a, an article about Howard University closing their classics department. Um, and one of the suggestions, I think it was on NPR, was that they should combine their classics department with um, other departments like philosophy, like um, African studies, to to build like a broader picture and make it more relevant to their students um, and I thought that was a really interesting idea because like you've said often we sort of think classics is Greek Rome everything else um, so would is that something that you would like to see in in more universities combining like mega departments where we think of things in wider contexts I guess I would like to ask that's it's a terrific question 
And if you see me smiling, it's um, because I am trying to think of a way of cleverly avoiding answering it. <laughs> only because only because it's so politically fraught. Um, you know, one learns in the sort of uh, administrative um, framework of a university um, that there probably isn't one answer that fits all. Um, if you look at uh, the sort of online debates about Howard, uh, the article written by the philosophers whose department was preserved, um, the backlash against that, it's just, it's so fraught. Um, in an ideal world without politics, could I answer your question? Yeah. If I went back and thought about how I'd like to be educated, um, the questions I asked in undergraduate classics courses and was told that's not, that's not our area. Um, yeah, absolutely, Rebecca. Um, uh, but, you know, you, you delve into those online conversations and you immediately find out that we're, we're not at all in an ideal world. We're, um, we're beset by politics on all sides. Thank you very much. Thanks. If we can take Oliver now. If you want to come on camera. Hello, I think you can see me and hear me properly, yes? Yes, you can. Yes. Um, good. Um, thank you, Patrice, for, for, for your talk, um, and particularly for framing part of it around Halberstam's idea of, you know, the creator of failure. Um, because I think there is, I've been working on it rather recently uh, for a project we're both part of, um, and um, I have realised that perhaps failure can bring new methodologies, perhaps is not the word, but new perspectives on how to break some of these questions in classics. One of them is precisely by doing bad classics, in a way, which is precisely by us becoming commentators of the present uh, with our own baggage of the past, which is something that I've always found rather interesting that, you know, people who do French studies or people who do Hispanic studies uh, are called upon and feel free to express their own visions of present France or present Hispanic speaking countries. Uh, but we still have this um, ghost of historicism looming over us that makes us kind of believe that we cannot speak of anything else after the fall of the Roman Empire, um, which I think is very much what 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 you have got to with the idea of precisely, uh, you know, from from your perspective, why doing classics doesn't quite make sense at the present moment as it should. Um, um, and also it helps us, I think, think about the, 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 the canon as well. I think there's a, a, a very productive place to think about failure with the canon, those things that have not been considered, all the pseudos, all the, you know, uh, uh, fragmentary work, which perhaps if we can configure it, not so much as the anecdote, so the, the, that which is not the canon, that that we can attach to the canon, if we look at it actually as that which questions the canon, that which brings fissures to the way we have seen an ancient Greece and ancient Rome. Um, I think it's also a very interesting perspective to go to. And finally, of course, looking at what is not the exceptionalism of uh, exceptionalism of Greece and Rome, and therefore a failure uh, to that standard, which then can create wonderful, positive new developments uh, in our discipline, as you say, by looking at other civilizations, other societies that are not Greek, Greek and Roman. So really, there's not really much of a question. It's thinking about, you know, what what you think around that, because I think it's a very productive place that we could be looking at. So do you think that failure, uh, embracing failure, working with failure can bring new perspectives to our discipline and perhaps solve some of these murky, problematic questions that we have on the table right now? Thank you, Patricia. Yeah, that's great. Thank you so much. That was very uh, enriching for me. Uh, you know, um, shout out to Mario Tello uh, and um, and Sarah Olson because uh, for those on the call, what these two co-authors did, these two editors did for us, was they created an intellectual community. Um, you know, I've never been uh, a, a part of a group like this where, because we're all uh, uh, writing essays for this volume on queer Euripides. They put together a syllabus for us, basically, 
and called us together on Zoom calls throughout the year. And we've been able to read works that we I would never have read. Um, and, and The Queer Art of Failure is one of those works, uh, um, as Oliver has just pointed out, among so many other rich works that I've been able to read in that context. But what, you know, and I love Queer, that's a, it's a great book. And, and one of the things that struck me, and uh, Oliver, your comments has helped me, have helped me to kind of um, synthesize this. What, one of the things failure does is it unveils the, um, it, it belies the world around us. It, it unveils what we thought to be the case. Um, you know, it's productive in that way. And this notion, for example, that we've been doing the classics objectively is one of the things that failure unveils, which is to say, in discipline, in the, in the disciplining, there is a kind of repressive hypothesis. And as I think Holly showed in her reading of those texts, Reality seeps through. The truth seeps through, right? Um, you can, uh, you know, let's come. Yeah, Freud had some things right. Uh, you, you, there, there's only so much you can repress the re reality of who you are, what your investments are, what you value, so on and so forth. And I think one of the great things about this moment in the classics is the way that people like Willamovitz, um, there's a scholar, I can't think of her name right at this moment, but she's doing work on uh, Breasted, the archaeologist. Uh, one of the founders of the Oriental Institute at the University of Chicago. You know, if you go through the work, and, and Holly did this last week, when you go through these works and you see what people are actually saying and what they're actually doing, do a deep reading of what they're actually doing, there's a repressive hypothesis involved and the way that their own racial identity, their gendered identity, their racial repressions, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, seep through um, is really something else. Right. So in discipline, practicing failure in a way, um, as I read uh, Halberstam, really kind of give, gives the lie to uh, the notion that we were doing anything otherwise. Um, and maybe it frees for, for me, uh, you know, it, maybe it's a bit freeing to say, OK, well, here's what I really want to do. Here, here, here's what really here's really what I wanted to ask. Um, and maybe now I can kind of do it with a little bit more freedom. Um, now that I'm naming that I care, you know, I'm sitting watching the, the um, uh, Mike, uh, Mike Tyson, um, a documentary riveted crying, you know, when he talks about walking around in fear that he says, everyone's afraid of me. I grew up in fear. Now I didn't grow up in the conditions of Mike Tyson, but I grew up in Brooklyn, New York. I know exactly what he's talking about. It's the same thing ta Coates is talking about. Um, so to enter Homer through Mike Tyson's eyes, you know, he is Achilles um, and he knows it. Um, you know, it's just a different uh, kind of entry point and vantage point on, um, on the world around us. If we name our investments, our value, our value and our values, um, you, you know, and I hope that is, it is of value to us on uh, making classics better that you had these wonderful talks um, and, and hopefully I'm in that uh, uh, a range of, of archive talks that, that people can put together and say, here are some perspectives, um, um, all of which are individual, but all of which together amount to a tapestry that's really important to us in our discipline. Thank you, Patrice. Thank you. There's a question in the chat from Stephanie Frampton, who doesn't have mic or camera, so I'll just read that out. She says, thank you so much for your talk. Thinking about the framework of a classical ancient world studies and the three other ancient old world cultures you mentioned, can you say something about the fact that nearly everywhere we look in antiquity, there's slavery? How do the artists and thinkers that you name and that you study, how do they think about this? How do you think about this? Yeah, that's a great question. It's a big one. Um, you know, in part, not just slavery, but let's say human sacrifice. When you look at Carthage, um, that's one of the things that uh, 
led to a kind of dismissal of Carthage, according to Carthaginia, according to Phoenician scholars, right? It, it's what led to a kind of view that this is not an exemplary people, right? This is not a peoples we want to emulate. Um, no, it's a great question. I, I don't know. I wish I wish we could talk because uh, I'd like to hear your thoughts on this. Um, reading about... I forget which culture it was that um, that actually rejected slavery as a concept and as a practice, but that that would be exemplary too to to think about exceptions to the rule that you named. Um, and I'll have to dig a little bit and try to remember which culture that was. Bunny has also asked in the chat, would you be happy to receive emails regarding further thoughts on Icarus and on Richard? So yeah, you're happy to. I'd, I'd love that very much so. Thank you That's very much. Great. Yep. Um, I can't P, see. P Rankin at Richmond.edu, very easy. P Rankin at Richmond.edu. Great, thank you. Um, can't see any other hands up or chats currently. Um, ah, but no, Stephanie has um, replied to your answer and she says it's something I struggle with, although of course um, it's the same for Greeks and Romans, obviously. And Amy has put your email in the chat, thank you. It's of course something that Greeks and Romans share with other ancient cultures and let us not forget, of course, that um, modern slavery is a phenomenon in um, numerous countries, including our own. Amy, go ahead, please. Hello, thank you so much, Patrice. That was fabulous, as usual. And um, it took me a little bit back to that time you took me to the museum in Indianapolis and showed me some amazing art that I, you out, out art historian me by a long shot. <laughs> but and that, <laughs> but that, that the message is it's, it's, it, it's, and I think Bunny said it earlier, it's about, uh, repeated it because it was your message, but, you know, looking through different perspectives, you know, different, share, I mean, this is why we all have to take each other to art galleries and read through books together and, you know, all, all of that stuff. Um, so sitting in my museum as I am, I felt a little bit guilty when um, Stephanie asked her question, her very good question, um, that wherever you look in museums and everything, there's, you know, there's slavery. Um, we have, and most of my students probably don't even know this, and probably my colleagues, you know, but we have an amazing South Italian vase that um, that shows a, a rare instance of, of slavery from South Italy, actually. It's got to be slavery, you know, people being taken off as, as slaves, you know, prison, prisoners of war and everything. Um, a man literally leading another man by by his, um, you know, leash. Um, uh, there's, as so often happens with uh, <clears throat> ancient art, um, especially the, the stuff that the Greeks did. There's no indication necessarily of race or color or anything like that. You can, you know, read read it in or out uh, depending on your whim, shall we say, or your perspective or your, you know, frame of reference or whatever it is. But the other thing that I think the more I think about beautiful, expensive, valuable art, it, especially old stuff, but new stuff too, is that that in itself is implying some level of force, imprisonment, slavery. There's so much ancient stuff that was done um, by craftspeople who were enslaved, you know. Mm -hmm. No one's gonna tell me that there weren't slaves working on the Parthenon, just because Phidias wasn't a slave doesn't mean, you know, there weren't people who were forced somewhere in the chain of, you know, whether it's cutting the stone or moving the stone or whatever. And and we completely overlook all of that. And I'm just wondering if there's much of this, if Michael Richards or any of the other chaps you talked about, or, you know, are they feeling almost guilty? Sorry, he's not feeling anything anymore, poor man. But, you know, <laughs> guilty kind of as I am as a curator, that, that, that there's just so much uh, exploitation of human labor in the in the business of art. Mm 
and making beautiful things. It, it, it's interesting. I, I wouldn't say so guilty, but um, you're giving me an, uh, an opportunity to come back to, um, to uh, Leonard Harris, because I said much of what I was going to talk about was pessimistic, but I said to everyone that I w was going to offer some hope. <laughs> um, and you're bringing me back to that, that hope, because what Leonard Harris is getting at is that we should side with the oppressed, that if we can think about the oppressed um, and the struggle, when he says that the suffering of Black people is not salvific, what he's getting at is if, you know, it's like, I don't know, those of you on the other side of the uh, Atlantic might not have uh, heard uh, a Speaker of the House, Nancy Pelosi, um, and her gaffe, where um, she says, uh, after the verdict of, um, of uh, 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 Chauvin, um, thank you, George Floyd. Thank you for dying for us. Um, because, you, you, because of your death, uh, we, we now uh, are, for, are closer to justice and so on. And people attacked her. And, but, you know, to be fair, she was borrowing uh, a page from, from Martin Luther King Jr., right? Suffering leads to freedom. Suffering is salvific. Um, the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends toward justice. What Leonard uh, does is to help us to kind of press pause on Pelosi's um, kind of um, buoyant, um, uh, triumphant uh, moment, her, her declaration, and, and to, to side with the suffering. No, not thank you, George Floyd, but why did you have to suffer? Why did that happen? And to lament, you know, back to the, the, the Greeks and, and lament. Um, and that, that in that, it's not so much guilt, but maybe lament helps us uh, toward something better, um, something more hopeful uh, that isn't as pessimistic as saying, you know, actually, there's no value in reception. Actually, um, uh, you know, uh, this is not so liber liberatory after all. No, um, you know, maybe that moment of, of siding with the suffering and lament um, is where it's at. Thank you. And perhaps empathy? Yeah, absolutely. That's a very thoughtful conclusion for us to come to and part of me wants to conclude right there with the hope that emerges from lamentation but actually I wonder if I could just prod another version of hope because you've spoken very eloquently about the collaborative volume that you're uh, doing and how you're having this you know kind of seminar drawing everybody together and you were also talking of course about these other ancient kingdoms about which as classicists we are obviously uneducated because obviously there's no there isn't the time and space in all the world but um are the people who study those african histories those carthaginian histories or possibly looking elsewhere the near eastern histories i mean are we aware of people who are asking the same kinds of questions about their versions of antiquity, wondering about values and wanting perhaps to collaborate with people like us who look in Gre at Greece and Rome primarily? That's a great question. I don't know, because right now I don't know them um, in that way. Right now I'm just reading their work and watching their, um, their YouTube videos. Um, uh, but um, I, you know that it would be wonderful if uh, if there were such a community. You know, um, uh, Matthias Hansas is also uh, doing something along these lines as it pertains to um, to W. E. B. Du Bois. And what's striking there? Someone asked about classics departments. They have changed the name of their classics department to something broader. I forget the exact title. Um, but that community involves um, people in Africana studies. Uh, people in um, uh, black existential philosophy, classicist, uh, uh, you know, literary people. That's a really uh, theater people, really eclectic community that, um, you know, more of that certainly, um, which is parallel to what uh, Tello and Olson have done. 
Uh, and I think they will do a volume on, on Du Bois coming out of uh, this community as well. That's really fascinating. Um, one of our colleagues asked, where can we find those videos on YouTube? Can you recall the title of those videos? Oh, goodness. If, OK, on Nubia, if, if you Google Virginia Museum of, if, or do it in YouTube, Virginia Museum of, of Fine Art Nubia Lecture, um, that's one. I, um, having discovered, and I'm looking for my volume, I, I put this in the PowerPoint, and having discovered uh, um, Susan uh, Blyer's work, I looked and saw that she has a number of YouTube videos. Oh, this uh, way? That's it, yeah, or the thank other you. Way? Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, to your point, Barbara, there's not enough time in the day, but um, she's got a number of YouTube videos as well. Um, so I'm looking forward to, um, to, to watching some of those, um, like, you know, whenever I, I can. Uh, but those are those are two examples. Of course, the volume on uh, on uh, Carthage that I mentioned, new on uh, the Phoenicians that I mentioned. There, I don't know if they recorded. Uh, there was a lecture on Cush here at the University of Richmond. I have to ask the chair of classics if she recorded that because if she did, I'd be happy to share that with Amy Smith as well uh, if if it's public uh, for public consumption. But there was a lecture here as well on uh, on Nubia. I think more and more classics departments are doing this. I think more people are you know, eager to invite students and to think about what students are interested in and um, how to kind of broaden uh, what we're doing um, uh, in the classics. That's very even, important. Even if it remains classics, right? Even if, you know, again, the politics of it and even if the university here, for example, doesn't kind of become classics and something else. Uh, but their invitational uh, moves uh, we had here as well. No, that's great. Although intriguing, as you say, it's it's a lot of it is university politics. And I know, for instance, the Department of Classics in Nigeria in Ibadan was very against being combined with any other department, say, of African studies, which is one of the things the university wanted to do because they read the reading, uh, the writing on the wall at that point for their own discipline. But um, one of our colleagues also asks us for, uh, in the chat, she asked for some reading tips. Of course, you've you've given us a couple of books about different cultures. Uh, possibly uh, that colleague is also interested in the other kinds of questions of value and sort of black classicism and so forth that you've been mentioning or touching on. Oh boy. Um... You know, I almost feel like we should begin to put together a resource um, that goes along with this. Like, sorry, Amy, I'm, I'm kind of <laughs> naming more work, even though you thought this was the last <laughs> lecture in the uh, in the series. But, um, uh, you know, things like the review essay that Emily uh, 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 Greenwood wrote about your book, Barbara, and mine, you, you know, um, that 2009, I think it was, review essay. I think Justine McConnell is on the call, you know, at least in terms of reception and contemporary thinkers, writers, artists. Um, there is a, a good uh, body of work now. I mentioned Tessa Roynan's uh, recent work. Mm. Of course, her first book was on um, Toni Morrison. You know, there are a lot of really good starting places for reception. And um, now I'm kind of, as you see, thinking about where we can go for, um, dare I say, reconstructing the ancient world a little bit uh, more as we think about um, other models. Uh, uh, besides reception, not beyond reception, because I th think we still need reception, but in addition to. Yeah, and let's look out for your volume uh, in the Critical Ancient World Studies, absolutely. So I've just put Tessa Roynan's name in the chat in case anyone wasn't sure how that was spelt. But you're right, that's a very recent work and, and you know, sort of more recent works that we see, they will have the bibliographies in them for the earlier pieces like that review essay that you were mentioning, Patrice, and you're kind enough to mention my and Michael's books. And it does seem astonishing that it was so long ago, but there is a real kind of re, you know, sort of re-questioning, isn't there? And a whole other wave of looking at these issues of 
I don't know, what should we call it? The ownership of classics, the identity of classics as a discipline. There's a whole, you know, as I say, new wave and um, impelled partly by new students as well as scholars, of course, like yourself and Emily Greenwood. So it's an exciting moment. Are there any more questions or comments in the chat? And if not, I'd like to thank Patrice so much for giving us such a great paper, which was so interesting in and of itself, and also such a brilliant ending to our series. Yes, and the, the, the chat is just saying thank you so much. And this has been a very important seminar series for us. And obviously I personally have enjoyed it enormously, all the talks, and it's been wonderful to see people coming from all over the place to um, join our seminars and it uh, it just couldn't have been better Patrice than to have you here and to um, give us these really important alternative perspectives so thank you very much and um, thanks everyone yeah thanks for being here thanks very much indeed okay. Amy you're yeah. muted Amy is it you're still muted Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much also for summing up so nicely the whole seminar series, in fact. Exactly. Um, great, great to have had you for as much of it as you could also. So thank you again. Thank you. Come come as soon All as you right, can. Right, everyone. Yes. Indeed. Indeed. Definitely. Definitely. Be well, everyone. Great. So stay well. Take care. Bye, Patrice.